Welcome to the All Our Coach podcast, my friends. My name is Tim Michalashvili. I'm your host. We talk about performance, how to inspire engagement in our business, sports, or in our contests, competitions, or life in general. And when we consider an Olympic event, the Olympics. It's the height of our performance, as well as the engagement that people, when they have that spirit, that Olympic spirit, very few of us have a chance to become an Olympian, become a competitor in the Olympics, or coach an Olympian or an Olympic champion. Well, my guest today, an Olympic gold medalist, Sally Pearson. She has dedicated most of her life to track and field, to coaching other champions, creating. Sally Pearson won the 2012 London Olympics in 100 meter hurdles. She set an Olympic record that stood for many years. She was a silver medalist in the previous Olympics. And my guest She's a director of sports credentials. She's been a head coach that trains not only athletes, but also other coaches. She's a franchisee at Aussie Athletics, Gold Coast North. And she's currently the coach, a rising star in athletics and 100 meter hurdles, Liz Clay, who competed in last year's Olympic Games and also in this year's World Indoor Championships. She's a life member of Athletics Australia. And today, uh, we're going to talk about what it takes to become a competitor in life, how to clear hurdles to make better and faster decisions. Sharon, uh, I'm so glad to be able to speak to you today. I look forward to our conversation. Thanks, Tim. (laughs) How did you get interested in this sport, track and field, uh, to begin with? Well, I was never an athlete. I was um, a somewhat sickly child I suppose I I used to go and sit on the sidelines and support my brothers and sisters playing hockey and rugby league and other sports um but when my daughter was nine she came home from school with um a flyer or a brochure about um athletic season starting up in this uh little country town that we just recently moved to um and so I took her down to the local oval and just got involved. Um, anything she did, I joined committees or join um, volunteer workforce or officials or whatever, and and um and just help help out. So that's how that's how and where I started. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad to be introduced to you by a colleague and a friend in my industry, Steve Royal, who I know you coached as well, and he's a track and field athlete who. How did you become a coach uh, that didn't only help your daughter, but ended up uh, coaching champions and and even gold medalists? Um, Well, the year after we joined the little country club, um, I was working for an airline called um, Bush Pilot Airways, (laughs) typical Aussie name, um, that became Air Queensland and ultimately um, the the regional arm of Qantas in Australia. And that was on the north side of Cairns in far north Queensland. Um, And the little country town we'd moved to was south of Cairns. And um, the club decided it was going to move from a Sunday morning started a club in Cairns because the big, the much bigger town didn't have um, this little athletics, it had a senior athletics club. Um, and so we um, advertised and broadcast and used a lot of contacts and networks and got a club started. And suddenly I had 83 little excited people <laughs> sitting in front of me and I thought, oh, my goodness, now what do I do? <laughs> I know I know how to... Uh, measure a throw in discus (laughs) you know I've watched other events but um 
what can I do from here? So I found out there was a coaching course and I went and did that. Did that was a level one and did level two and three and um, um, most of my education. Asking questions, mm -hmm. you know, learning about people, like just asking other coaches questions and, and just having long conversations with people and athletes. Right. And it takes a lot of observation, I think. Uh, some of the best coaches are the ones that really reflect on the human condition. Uh, and I think being a parent probably helps with that, given that, you know, your experience with your daughter was really what started you, right? Your interest in athletics and, and, and coaching and being a parent is, is, a, is an important lesson in life on, on what leadership means and what coaching is as well. Do you think that you always tended to observe and be very perceptive of other people? Uh, was there something, uh, a coach in you that manifested later in life? I think, um, I think we're all products of our lives. And my mum passed away um, just before I turned 12. Um, and I had six siblings, one older, the rest younger, the youngest two. Um, I'd, I'd been nurse, nursing and nurturing the three younger ones um, for a couple of years. Mum mm -hmm. wasn't very well. And, you know, you, you become, like you said, an observer of people, an observer of people who are interested in you or what you do or people who just aren't and you move on spend more time with with the people who offer some um, synergies in your life some something to assist something you can assist yeah I think I learned that from a pretty young age yeah uh, and you must have had uh, you know this a commitment to to high performance or to performing on and excelling at the highest level, which you ultimately taught Olympians how to do. Uh, and, and you started from a clean slate, right? You mentioning those 83, you know, young people, right? <laughs> uh, so what is the role of curiosity and really not having prior athletics experience and just looking outside of the box? What role did that have in your success? Um, well, I'm somewhat timid for much of the time. So when I go into situations, I like to go in with as much knowledge and as much confidence mm. as possible, particularly when you're looking after young children and, you know, they want to look up to you and know that, that they can believe you and understand you and, and, believe that you know what you're talking about so education was really key for me all all along my journey and you know whether that was formal or informal and um much of it definitely was was informal reading books reading biographies trying to understand people and how they thought and how they got through situations and um yeah probably one of the most impactful books that I read was about one of your people, Aaron Ralston, in um, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. You know, this guy had to cut off his arm to survive. That's pretty drastic, but impressive to, to read that book over and over again and see how he planned his trip and how he went about his trip and then how he faced that adversity with processes. So I'm a big process-driven person, and that really will resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so methodical and systematic approach. Yes. Quite a, quite a, somewhat of a scientific approach as well. Yeah, uh, data analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so with Sally, just kind of fast-forwarding a little bit to Sally Pearson, uh, she underwent quite a few challenges and difficulties, right? Injuries as well. How did you help her manage them using your approach or curiosity? Uh, yes, I coached Sally for 14 and a half years. So she was just 12 and a half 
when um, she joined my squad. And so I had a long time to get to know her, get to know her body, how she reacted to different training methodologies, how she, um, you know, how fast she healed when she did have little niggles, just to really understand and know the person standing in front of me as much as I could. So much, just had to learn so much about her. And I heard that she had a navicular stress fracture, right? And you came up with an innovative, <laughs> innovative way to co coach. Yes, yeah, certainly. And and she was pretty young when that happened. Um, she she was doing a subject at high school called dance, so she was pretty active. And um, and somehow she ended up, you know, with a combination, probably possibly of dance and athletics. She ended up with a navicular stress fracture, which was misdiagnosed he, um, for quite a while. And, um, and then we went to Melbourne and, and Athletics Australia's um, chief medical officer. We saw him and he diagnosed that it was by that stage a total fracture. So um, there was a fair bit of rehabilitation. And when she, she was... Um, walking and then jogging very slowly I thought I thought this girl really needs to feel speed like she lived for speed speed was part of her DNA from when she was really quite young so um, I used race walking as a tool for her to get that fix that speed fix so we'd get on the track and um, she was 14 at this stage and mm -hmm. um she race walked and I would time her and she would try and beat her time. Like mm -hmm. she might not have passed um, the judges that might not have passed all the rules of race walking, but right. she right. was, she was walking very fast with extremely low impact. So that's what I was trying to work on, make sure that she could feel speed, no speed, but without the impact of sprinting and certainly definitely not hurdling at that stage. Mm -hmm. And what impact did that have? Uh, do, you th do you feel that was a successful strategy later on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I felt it was extremely successful. And yeah. it was a segue into, into then to start um, lifting the knees a little bit and getting a bit of stride length and therefore a bit of impact on the track um, so that we could ensure that the foot was going to hold up. There wasn't going to be any repeats. Um, she never had another stress fracture in a foot um, ever, so that you I can remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, you mentioned that you like to study something completely in its full detail, be prepared, because probably preparation is the best uh, antidote to anxiety or nervousness or being timid. Uh, so if we look at the other end of it, how did you develop that confidence over time as a coach, as a celebrated, recognized coach? What were some of the terms that, that gave you that feeling of confidence as, as a coach? Certainly, I think across any aspects of life, I think success breeds confidence. And so as I grew up with Sully and and you know, the other athletes that I was coaching, I had a whole squad of, of athletes. As I grew up with them, I grew more and more confident. Um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm 100% confident now. I, I think I'd definitely be lying, but, um, you know, I, I think it's a lifelong learning situation, coaching, so you never know everything. Um, we get bombarded with information these days on on um, digital, you know, platforms, and it can be mind-boggling at times. And knowing how to sift through that and and pick out what's real and what's a bit of rubbish is another skill that you have in your coach's toolbox, I guess. Yeah, well, that's a, that's an interesting statement there. So here you say that you don't consider yourself confident, even though you've coached 
uh, an Olympic gold medalist, uh, and you've dedicated your entire life, uh, and you've created so many innovative ways to train, it just emphasizes how you strive for performance and improvement, regardless of the, the accomplishments and the feats that you have achieved in, in life and in your career. Uh, I'll just pick up on on something. Confidence comes from having success, as I mentioned, but every single athlete standing in front of me is a different story and a different pathway and a different background. And so um, incredible success with one athlete does not in my life mm. mean that I'm an incredibly successful coach. I I'm successful if I've gained major improvements with this girl and that boy and that young man and that young woman and mm. and all the different people standing in front of me. So, you know, you have to, being a coach of a person in an individual sport particularly means you've got to coach that person. So you've got to keep coming up with different cues even, as basic as different cues for different things for different people. Um, one of the other things that I had started doing with a young woman I was coaching before Sully uh -huh. was we, we were doing what I call sprinting in the pool. Oh. So the, the athlete stays upright. Um, there's no weighted vest. They've just got to use their abs to hold themselves up upright, use their glutes to do the tiniest, weeniest little movement with the legs to, um, to keep themselves afloat and keep themselves upright and just sprint with their arms um, through that water resistance. Um, and they can, in fact, go... Um, they can start off as a, as a new... Um, coaching methodology, the first time they come into pool, they can um, be extremely, extremely slow and they, their chin keeps hitting the water and I tell them when that happens just to stop, otherwise they're going to drown. But I've never had anyone drown yet. Um, and But they get extremely fast. So they, um, when you're looking at sprints, for example, um, the average female might take about 50 strides to cover 100 metres. Right. Um, in the pool, they can cover those 50 strides in about six or seven seconds. Wow. That's, it's just like I still shake my head and I still marvel at it, but I have my senior squad, um, so those who have finished high school, so they're aged minimum 18, um, I still have them doing sessions two or three times a week, pretty much year round, even in winter. I'm horrible. Wow. Make them get in the pool. <laughs> yeah, in winter, they don't like it, even though the pool. And so is, is that a technique, uh, I'm just curious, that you came up with or was it inspired by someone else or something that you had read? Um, yeah, I'd seen... Um, um, uh, quite a few coaches doing pool sessions, but the athletes were horizontal on the pool, so holding onto the edge, um, lying across the top of the water, kicking legs or, right. or whatever, or they were walking through the pool and it was extremely slow and laborious. And right. speed animals need, or speed athletes need to feel speed. So I thought, I wonder if I can put a flotation vest on an athlete and get them upright in the pool so that they could time work much faster. And so I just experimented um, yeah. with a young woman who, who had um, injured her patella. So she had a fall. And um, so the whole upper limb and lower limb were all affected because of this patella. Um, injury so and eventually she got good at it and we took the um, weighted vest off and then she got extremely fast so it's great so it really enhances a rehabilitation program because you can put them in the water um, there's almost no injury that precludes them from doing this work in the pool except um, in the early two to three week stages of a hamstring injury but 
um, if they're strong enough, they can actually hold themselves afloat with just the one leg and just leave the other leg out of the equation. So um, Liz did that with, she had a bit of a hamstring niggle, wasn't a tear, just a, a, a niggle, mm -hmm. we call it. And, um, and she was able to do it with one leg. Despite the injury? Yeah. Yeah, wow. The scientific method uh, and the sportsmanship as well. And, you know, I, I think that it, it, it's so relevant in many different fields, you know, across life and business, uh, regardless of a person's background or their training. I think if, if we learn how to think like sports athletes or like scientists, I think these are the two most valuable mindsets to have. To continue to experiment. Uh, so, you you often mention uh, being a part of a team, integral members of that team that helped you become successful, uh, helped you as well as the, the the people that you coached, the athletes you coached. Well, in in Australia, we have in each state academies or institutes of sport, and they have scientists on staff who once your athlete um, gets to a fairly high standard and it's very selective so they need to be at <clears throat> quite a high standard then you can get assistance from the sports scientists that um, are employed by the institutes or academies so one of the first sports scientists I had exposure to was a biomechanist mm -hmm. and that was sort of in the fairly early days of biomechanics um, and she was just fantastic and she taught me so much and uh, all along the pathways I was teaching her as well she was learning about the sport of hurling or sport of sprinting or mm -hmm. um, you know and that, that helped her as well and then she um, had a baby and um, moved back to, she and her husband moved back to the town in New South Wales where she came from and yeah, we got a new biomechanist and he's over in the States now. <laughs> he, he was with us for about a decade, Dan Greenwood. Yeah, but he's in high performance sport over there and so they were really helpful and right from the very first athlete who had a, an injury from when I was a real novice coach I I made it my my job to if if I had an injured athlete I wanted to go to the physiotherapist with them because I wanted to learn mm. um, about how it might have happened <coughs> excuse yeah. me and and about the treatment that they were suggesting and about how I could help and what I could observe on the track and what I could look out for to ensure that, that that athlete had the best rehabilitation possible. So I can't always, and not for all athletes, but I ask parents of the young ones if they can uh, um, suggest to the physio, could they email me a report so that I'm getting communications as well. And, I'm, and, I, and I develop a rapport with as many of the physios as I can as well. So, um, you know, and, and that works both ways because I've had athletes referred to me for coaching by physios. So, you know, building the squad, it's a good thing. So um, I certainly didn't do science in high school. I did shorthand typing, bookkeeping, stream, um, and... I, I only did um, up to grade 10 that we have in Australia, which meant I finished high school at 15. <laughs> so I didn't have a scientific background, but I've learned as much as I could. And my husband has always been the strength and conditioning coach for my um, athletes as well. Liz Clay, who was at the Olympics last year, mm -hmm. um, she, she um, found another strength and conditioning coach and a gym that was sort of smaller, more private, um, 
work better for her. And so he and I work extremely closely together as well. So um, again, you, you learn from athletes, you learn from you learn from the scientists, you learn from other coaches. Mm-hmm. A husband and wife team of coaches <laughs> and athletes. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, yes, my husband's actually a jumps coach. He well, he's a she's he's a um, IAAF or World Athletics Level Five um, coach in multi events as well. So yeah. he can coach across the board. So he's very handy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's What's important also uh, about what you said uh, here to to note, I think, is that. Uh, the athletes they often need multiple coaches not just one coach that many of us uh, regardless of whether or not we're athletes or we know a lot about track and field I think can can learn from from you and your experience and, and a lot of athletes as well that you mentioned and how personalized I think those approaches have to be because your dedication is absolutely personal you manage um, uh, not just the athlete's performance but their life in, in a sense from a perspective of not the coach but the, the athlete you uh, primarily coached individual uh, athletes and athletes who competed in individual events not in teams uh, Correct. How, how did they uh, consider their competitors or those in their club let's say in their track club what role did teamwork play in in, in an athlete who competes in an individual event is it is it still relevant uh, being being a part of a team and a team player even if- oh i i absolutely believe so and um one of the things where i think um athletics falls down really badly mm-hmm. is in people um athletes and parents of young athletes avoiding their athletic competitors and so going to a different squad or going to a different coach because, oh, no, we can't go to Sharon Hannon because she coaches, you know, Sally Pearson or whatever, and that's their competitors. And I think they've got it just remarkably wrong, extremely wrong, because I think if you want to be the best and get the best out of yourself, you train with the best. And so I've had coaches that I've coached for a few years and someone else joins the squad and beats them. And then suddenly they just leave, you know, whether it was a grown up person who made that decision themselves or whether it was a high school kid who's who themselves or their parents made that decision. And I think they were the poorer for it. I I do believe absolutely that they were the poorer for that decision. Mm-hmm. If you want to be, if you want to be the best that you can be, because right. that's all you can be, the very best that you can be, then you need to train with the best. Yeah, and and if you really want to make that dream of becoming an Olympian or an Olympic champion come true, then then probably you really need to know the, your competition well. And and that brings me to that question that you know many people who are skeptics who watch a lot of very promising athletes young athletes and who say yeah they're great but you know they really have to go through the hoops and many you know to jump through many hoops and 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 uh, uh in order to actually reach that you know that the pinnacle of competition which is the olympics let's say so what you know how were you able to take your athletes to the olympics and and, and excel there not not everyone did so what are some of the ingredients, key ingredients? Because I think I, I, a lot of us who are not as familiar, right, with, with uh, that environment on that, that level or with performance at that high level, uh, we think that there's something else, some secret ingredient at play there and that only few people know about. So maybe you can give us a glimpse of <laughs> what you think looking back. <laughs> You know, I do believe there's a secret ingredient in some, mm-hmm. um, and and Sully had that. Sully, from a, an extremely young age, she was a gymnast for many years um, in very early childhood and doing extremely long hours each day. Um, but she was driven, you know, an athlete who 
or a young person who just wanted to do sport and wanted to beat everybody. Um, you know, sometimes you have to temper that a little bit because they need to be extremely respectful of anyone who's better than them and do what they can do for themselves to get better. But some, some young people aren't that driven, don't have that single mindset of being the very best that they can be. Um, they, they participate in sport to have a great deal of fun and enjoyment. And that's, that's awesome, you know, and without that, there wouldn't be sport across the world. They must enjoy it. But as they get, as I've mentioned about me before, success brings confidence. And as they have a little success and a little bit more success and they nail a technique they've been working on and that's success and all those little tiny steps start developing in them that urge and that drive to continue that successful pathway. Um, and, you know, so suddenly you've, you've now got a person who is extremely coachable and who is starting to believe that they could compete on the international stage. Mm -hmm. um, that same person could have lots of daily distractions from um, their social life and um, their aspirations to be, um, I don't know, in, in extremely social environments where they're going out a lot and having fun and, um, or they could be um, money driven. Young people want wheels. They want to have a car right. as early as possible. Right. So they work, you know, two or three jobs and, and, um, and save, save, save and buy cars at a fairly young age or as soon as they're legally able. And, you know, so different things drive different people. So my role is just to keep planting those little seeds that, you know, you can be successful. You can, you can definitely get to medal level in the Australian Championships. Mm -hmm. And then I believe you can get beyond that onto an international team. So it's... It's about yeah, so one small step at a time. Incremental uh, yeah. progress is really the key, right? To, to the yeah. international level of competition. Uh, and, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I once uh, shared a flight with an Olympic medalist uh, who uh, whose lesson I remember to this day. Unfortunately, I never practiced it, even though I competed and I was very competitive in many different sports. I do have a few trophies, but they ended at about high school stage. I didn't really go on after that. Um, uh, but, you know, she mentioned that she used to pra pra you know, practice many, many hours a day, which to me uh, seemed unfair. During which I came alive myself, right? But I didn't have the discipline to practice beforehand. And so... I think I think the commitment. What you mentioned uh, is 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 the curiosity, uh, right? And uh, and that that commitment as well uh, that that are incredibly important. Uh, the confidence, right? That you mentioned that build builds up as you succeed, and and probably as you and then the preparation. Now a little bit about the relationship between the coach and the the athlete well, relationship with Sally has been publicly, you know, discussed and, you know, became somewhat of a, you know, well, well-known fact that you separated, you parted ways um, and, and you nevertheless have, you, you continue to coach many other athletes. Um, can you speak a little bit about what are some lessons that you've learned and what you would recommend to other coaches uh, in order to manage conflict with their athletes or in order to uh, develop relationships you know that 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 lead to positive good outcomes um well 
given that I started coaching Sally when she was 12 and a half, yeah. um, the relationship we had in those early years and through that 14 and a half years um, definitely evolved and evolved and, you know, became internationally successful and, and changed at the same time. So towards the last couple of years, there were, there were some, some behaviours that I didn't think were appropriate given the status of the person and how young athletes are uh, really looked up to, to that and how, how communication changed between us on a daily, you know, in our daily training environment as well. Um, and, you know, I think it was more so instigated by the change of being an athlete who was hunting for success and then an athlete who became the hunted. You know, so uh, everyone else was chasing Sally yeah. Pearson. Yeah. Um, because the year before, so she got silver medal in um, Beijing. Um, and the year before the Olympic Games in London, she won the world championship in Daegu in so close to a world record time. But it was a championship record as well. Um, and, you know, she was the pinnacle. She was the best in the world across, you know, the years that it took her to work up to that and then um, to hold. And um, in Australia, there was so much pressure on her or she, she put a lot of pressure on herself to repeat and with that came a lot of anxiety and distress yeah not just stress but distress and so it it was very hard to keep Sally somewhat calm and just focused on herself I see and yeah ultimately the relationship broke down at the end of 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been, of course, quite, quite stressful and uh, you know, frustrating for you. How were you able to recover yourself as a coach, as, as a coach also with a long-term vision uh, driven by performance to continue to coach others and uh, you know, create a legacy, create other champions? Um. I actually don't think that it really affected me personally. Oh, I see. Um, in my in my daily work, which is which is coaching, you know, and other things like coach education, managing an athletics track, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, I just love what I do, and yeah. you know, like I've said, every athlete standing in front of me is an individual and that and I believe I'm coaching individuals they might all line up beside each other and I might say set boom um and they'll all take off but um you know everyone's an individual so um I don't I don't think I suffered terribly much but me as a potential coach for others probably in their mindset suffered a little you know some people might have chosen not not to come to me for coaching because you know I'd broken up with Sally Pearson or whatever I don't I don't really know and that's that's not something that I've dwelt on because that's not something I could really change people right. will make up their own minds but yeah. in, um, in 2016, so three years later, um, Liz Clay moved up from Sydney and, you know, left her family and all her friends and moved to the Gold Coast and um, chose me as a coach. So she was already, you know, in her 20s and, and I think that spoke volumes of both her 
her decision making and her respect for me as a coach. So um, we've been together six years now and she did also compete in Eugene this year, yeah. um, but she was involved in the carnage that was the women's hurdles and has um, since had yeah. surgery and yeah, uh, a few fractures in that foot and two dislocations as well. And it's going to be a long road to recovery, but um, she's, she's absolutely committed. Yeah. So uh, I know it may have not been the most pleasant question to ask, but uh, looking back, I'm so glad that you, uh, you provided some clarity, uh, which brings out loud and clear your, your, your commitment and your character, your strong character as a coach and, and your, the passion for what, you, for you, what you do throughout the years. Did you find yourself being a, someone who challenges athletes as well uh because my hypothesis is that the people that love us most or that are closest to us are the ones that probably challenge us the most and make us probably sometimes most most upset as well so do, yeah, do, that's do you see yourself as a coach who is a very who is strict and who's very who challenges athletes more than others and asks the kind of questions that others won't or um i don't know about strict some some people have told me they're scared of me. <laughs> um, I, I have I have boundaries and rules, particularly with the younger ones, uh -huh. um, and I think that's important because some of them don't have that at home, and some of them do. And you know, like I'm pretty famous across Australia uh, for one of my rules, and that's if if an athlete breaks in false starts in training, their session's over. Oh. They have, have to walk. And um, last year or like the year before, I had a young athlete left my squad because um, she'd broken twice in a matter of a few months. And I, you know, I said, that's it, session's over the second time, same as I said the first time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, yeah, she and her family decided to go find a different coach, which is Mm -hmm. call. that's their prerogative but um you know I, I think I, th I think you've got to coach the event and if you false start in a race you're disqualified so yeah. you know I just al just align my guidelines um I've I've coached athletes who I sat out and had lengthy chats to about um you know their their long-term girlfriend who um, lived uh, about a thousand kilometers away where this athlete used to live until he relocated. And I, I said, come on, you know, Brendan, you know, you really need to be thinking about your future, not just your, your athletics, but, you know, Nikki's not gonna hang around forever. You, you need to um, decide whether you're going to marry her or not. He said, I am, I am. And I said, we'll do it now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty blunt, but <laughs> yeah, look, you, you do have definitely have influence and um and and a big part in in some athletes' private lives because they they talk to you about so many aspects of their lives. And mm -hmm. you know, I've I've had I've had athletes um you know, coming to me crying about something that happened at home, and and I I've just tried to to just explain the the parents' take on the situation and and the parents, um, you know, the way that they looked at the situation. Um, I've had parents come to me and say, look, um, you know, my child is 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 just not putting in the study for their schoolwork. You know, we know they can be do better. Their their grades are going down. They've become obsessed with athletics. <laughs> and um and so we're going to start using training as as a um you know as a takeaway. So if they don't improve their grade or until they prove improve their grades we're not going to allow them to come to training mm -hmm. and um you know at, 
me as a mum and a grandma, I um I you know how can you fault that sort of decision making process where we're in a knowledge world and and we have to work really hard to learn as much as we can, regardless of whether the kids think that maths is important, they're not going to use algebra. Yeah. It's important that they use their brains and they learn to um, take in knowledge, retain knowledge and regurgitate knowledge. So, you know, I don't have a problem with parents um, yeah. using training attendance as, as a... Um, as something that they can withhold until behaviour improves. And, and yesterday had a young girl um, qualify to go to our state championships in long jump and in the 100. And she missed two months of training this year because exactly because of that, um, not because of um, um, her grades were going down, but because she'd been misbehaving. And so the parents withheld training and we talked about it yesterday and she said, I'll never do anything like that again. <laughs> I'm a good girl now. <laughs> you know, and, and I think incredible life lesson from the parents and, and, you know, they definitely have buy-in from me as well, because you've got to be a good person in this world um, first and foremost, before you can be an athlete. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just uh, brilliant words there, words of wisdom. Sharon, you mentioned your daughter being a mom. Uh, I'm very curious to see if your daughter continued on her path to becoming an athlete. Or you, you had invested so much time into so many athletes and young athletes. How about your daughter? Just curious if did she uh, can, is she in any way associated with athletics? How about that? <laughs> Um, she loves athletics and particularly her oldest daughter is obsessed with Mondo de Plantis, discovered, discovered him during the, um, 2021 Olympic games and has followed him ever since. Oh, the and, um, holder. yes. Right? yes. The holder, the holder. For those, yes. of, those uh, see, I followed uh, track and field. Not everyone may follow track and field on the all out coach, uh, audience, but yeah. So, so your granddaughter may become a, a, a pole wall, pole vaulter. No. <laughs> No, she's just personally, personally obsessed with Mondo and and you know, just just his moves over the bar and how he gets up there and how he he seems to be able to do it so easily. Um, no, unfortunately, I have three grandchildren and they. Um, our grandson hasn't so much played sport um, for quite a few very good reasons, but. Um, uh, the two girls have played sport through school, um, basketball, basketball, oh, okay. volleyball, yeah. hockey, yeah. gymnastics, um, you know, because sport is part of the ethos of the boarding school they came down to. And that's that's where I'm head coach um, yeah. of athletics and cross country at the moment. Um, but, you know, they, they well, uh, the youngest is only in graduation year from high school this year, so she graduates in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, so who's to know whether she'll carry on with sport? But they've all, they all helped us in the business with major, major events. Some of your listeners um, may have even um, sent one of their children to Australia with a group called Down Under Sports, and we ran the Down Under Championships in Australia for 19 years until COVID um, and uh, it was a huge event in our the fight, not 2019 or 2018, um, there was over 300 American high school kids who came out and interestingly, Emma Coburn, um, who's your well famous steeplechaser, multiple mm -hmm. champion, Mm -hmm. um, she ran her first ever steeplechase event at the Down Under Championships in Australia um, at the 2013 World Championships in Moscow. I was in a lift at our team hotel and a group of American athletes um, got in the lift and this one guy said to me, Australia? Oh, actually, I won't even try and do the American accent. <laughs> and he said, Australia? Um, he said, I've been to Australia. I've been to Brisbane and, and 
And um, he said, I competed there at the Down Under Championships. And I said, well, you, 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 you landed in Brisbane, but you actually came to the Gold Coast for the Down Under Championships. Um, and yeah, he was, he was doing high jump. So yeah. in my retirement, when I sit back, I'm going to go through all my results from all the Down Under Championships and all the American results. I'll Google every one of them and I'll work out how many American high school kids who came out for Down Under ended up on the world stage. I think that would be a very good little research project. Oh, okay. <laughs> Being sad, the, the, there you go. That's uh, the, that's the approach to have to 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 be successful and to pass on uh, these lessons. I think to to the other coaches as well who are listening here. I think to us, uh, and you know, it's, it's keeping track of those records. Uh, I remember uh, when I was probably eight, nine years old watching the Olympics and, you know, these were my idols, uh, a lot of the track and field athletes, Carl Lewis, you know, back in the day, of course, and, and many others, I used to uh, measure my long jumps, I would always have a tape measure, I still do that today with my children. Right, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, and find all kinds of different interesting ways to kind of inspire them to uh, finally jump over a mat. You know, uh, like telling them to imagine that there's a puddle, dirty puddle uh, over it and just try to find. And, and I actually recorded that as a result of kind of saying that she probably, uh, my daughter, she broke a record. And to this day, we actually run. I have them run uh, 100 meters in the mornings and they they track their personal records. I make them do that in their yeah. notebook. So I don't have the athletics background, but I at least I have that coach's mentality, uh, Sharon. <laughs> Uh, that I'm trying to pass pass along to my children, and uh, so who knows if m my dream of becoming an Olympian may uh, ha hasn't come true. Maybe th theirs will. A couple of things I didn't respond to in your previous question. Um, <laughs> my my daughter was a race walker, and um, ultimately she got um, pubis synthesis. So um, at the joining of the hips, where the pubic bones um, have cartilage between them that that um, became inflamed and long term inflamed. It was wasn't diagnosed for quite a while, so she ultimately had to give up race walking. Um, but yeah, she she loves watching athletics, and she went to America um, on um, an Australian tour group similar to Down Under Sport, which is now. Um, uh, reinventing itself as coast to coast athletics over there and they're going to bring out a group next year again but um, she went to America and she got to meet Carl Lewis at the Mount Sac Relays so yeah. there's a little bit of a tie in there as well oh wow yeah yeah, uh, yeah. in sports I think injuries and excelling in performance are hand in hand and there, there's, there's the lines are so blurred between them, and that also is something that I've observed for many years. There's such a, a short uh, kind of distance between an injury, I guess, and, and success. One thing that I wanted to mention to you is that I used to my interest in my love for track and field dates back many years, as I mentioned. But you know, coming to New York, I used to attend the Grand Prix every year, and I'd always get the front row seats. Uh, and I one one year I had the the fortune of witnessing uh, Usain Bolt's uh, world record, oh, right? wow. 972 in 2008. Yeah. yeah, which I still remember to this yeah. day. And so I, I tell that to my children all the time. So now they tell me that they they actually got a chance to witness Duplantis's world record. Uh, so they're, they're kind of, that's their re response. Sharon, I've really enjoyed hearing a lot of these nuances, these details that to me, they were absolutely inspirational. Uh, I think you bring, uh, you bring in a perspective of how to draw that competitiveness inside of you, become more confident with success, with be committed and also be curious. Right. And, and I think those are the four C's that you told me about. Is there a final message that you would like to share with those who are going to listen to this discussion, who are, who are coaches, who may be aspiring coaches or athletes, or who may not even be athletes, um, how to, uh, you know, excel in whatever it is that you do, uh, improve your performance and also 
your your relationships as well with others use as many mentors as you can okay. you know just talk just talk to people they might not even or you might not even realize at the time that they're mentoring you but if you're asking someone a question then you're learning and to me um if it's a coach it's mentoring um if it's live if it's a life question you're asking you know if you've got something you can't quite um work out and you're asking someone it's it's mentoring so it's advice it's enhancing enhancing your your skills across everything that you do and say i think uh, well it, personally uh, i can tell you that i've gone from measuring my long jumps and those are my daughters uh, to measuring performance in the pharmaceutical industry, in the medical affairs function, where performance mm -hmm. is not always measured uh, with numbers and words, but rather communicated via pictures, which leaves a, a lot to interpretation. And that's what I'm trying to change by, uh, with the company that I formed, uh, Amadeus Pharma, uh, mm -hmm. where I'm helping other organizations inspire future performance and also measure it using a medical productivity index that I've created. So for me, you know, an, an inspiring performance is ever so critical today in a fast paced environment and business environment and our industry as well. So I really look forward to your lessons, which are relevant to many of my colleagues as well in our upcoming medical affairs innovation Olympics, in which you'll be a keynote speaker. And I'm ever so grateful to Steve, Stephen, Stephen Royal for introducing <laughs> me and to bringing me that much closer to that lifelong dream of being in an Olympic through listening and living through the, your experiences there. So um, thank you very much again, Sharon. Let's continue to stretch ourselves and lift others, my friends at All Our Coach. Uh, feel free to, to let people know how they can contact you. Uh, sure. I, I have a website, um, sportscredentials.com.au or through Athletics Australia if they, they'll find me. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It's been a uh, pleasure.